Awesome. Welcome back. Episode 22 or 23, I think, Robin, of this season, but more importantly, episode 50 for us. Congratulations, brother. Damn. <laughs> Congratulations, brother. I uh, got your message today and uh, I was just so happy. We're 50 episodes in and, uh, you know, we really had a chance to interview a lot of the breweries and brewers that we wanted to and I think more than anything that's been my real enjoyment out of this whole 50 episodes has been getting a chance to talk to the uh, breweries and the brewery owners you know it's been really wild yeah it's pretty crazy to see how far it's come and um, you know we started off in your uh, house in front of the the (laughs) cellar cellar. and and, you know just talking about hip-hop and and beer and 50 49 episodes later yeah like you said we've had some amazing brewers join some amazing yeah. people join us we've great, created some amazing friends yeah amazing events like it's just been, yeah. it's been an awesome two ish years year and a half ish yeah yeah it's uh, been a, a whirlwind of a ride especially this year i think we really decided to kind of kick it into high gear and uh get a little more consistency and i think that i i really enjoyed it i think you enjoyed it just being on the microphone on a more regular basis um and hopefully the listeners have been enjoying it too yeah i hope so absolutely so thank you as well to the listeners for tagging along with us for these Mm -hmm. 50 episodes from our humble beginnings of figuring shit out to you know at least having kind of a basic understanding of what we're doing now (laughs) (laughs) but honestly yeah a huge thank you to the listeners because i mean we wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for you as well for so thank you everybody that takes the time to put us into their day whichever time it is wherever you may be um i love it it's crazy yeah Uh, hopefully uh, another another 50 uh soon and to, to many many more after that even yeah, absolutely. And I bought for our guest tonight, we do have, we'll talk about it shortly, but I brought out their, I'm going to have their barrel age triple <laughs> to celebrate 50. So we have uh, Salter Street joining and they delivered a nice Jeez. little package. And this one's a Chardonnay barrel aged Belgian triple, which we'll talk about um, with Tanner. Tanner, But um, yeah, for 50, I figured I'd celebrate. It's, it's crying tears on my desk right now because <laughs> I'm just trying to get it to te- room temperature. Here. <laughs> That's too funny. It's been so hot lately. I feel that uh, you pull the beer out the fridge and if you don't finish it within 20 minutes, then it's just barley tea after that, that you're having. Yeah. hundred percent. It's so true. <laughs> and speaking of hot and the fact that patios opened up on Friday, how was your weekend, man? It looked like you had a great weekend enjoying some of the finest spots. Yeah, it was it was so much fun. I had planned like to go out on Friday for sure. Uh, Saturday was a bit of a question mark. Sunday was a bit of a question mark. So Saturday or Friday night, uh, Linda and I, my wife, we uh, decided to head off to Bandit. And as a funny story, um, got to Bandit, put our name down and we were told it's a 40 minute wait. So we decided to walk over to Henderson's, maybe have a beer there and then we'd walk right back to Bandit. Got to Henderson's sat down right away bandit calls they're like we've got a table for you so we're running over to get to the brewery in time but i uh, got there got a chance to touch base with uh benoit and stefan again awesome and uh just enjoy some of their amazing beers man um that that turmeric uh tamarind uh wizard of gosa got to try that was just absolutely incredible oh nice. and uh on saturday i also had a chance to drop by rain hard and shacklands i had to go by because they're just so incredible how was that uh, slushy beer? A legit, like that's like a beer in a, a frozen slushy machine, right? Like, yeah. So somebody was like, I, I, you know, this is a slushy beer that at least won't explode if you leave it out at room temperature. For more it'll just melt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it'll, it'll, become, it'll become liquid. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it was a, it was really a slushy beer. It tasted like, you know, I had a few people on IG reach out to me and I was like, tastes really like an icy, you know, those, those old school ices you'd get at like, Woolworth or, or wherever, you know, they were really decent. It was really decent. Um, nice. I know that they had two going, but only one was ready. So I only got a chance to try the one. But for anybody that wants to try something really cool and interesting, I'd say head to Shacklands and try their slushy beer that's actually a slushy. You'd probably enjoy that. Though, did you make it out, brother? I, 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 I got to know, man. We, like, where we did tried to. So we did go. We took downtown for a walk. Um, so downtown had shut off the one strip of Dunlop Street to make okay. the patios more open and, yeah. and make open walking space, which is a really neat idea. They're going to do it all summer. So nice. we we walked up the strip. We had Thanos with us, so we had never taken him to a patio yet. Um, <laughs> and, and it was his second birthday. Happy nice. birthday, Thanos. Um, Happy birthday, Thanos. And we, uh, <laughs> so we signed in at Flying Monkeys. And similar to you, 
we, it was, we took a walk and it was a while. It was about a 45 minute wait or so too, I guess, similar. And, and we went to another spot. We sat down, ordered drinks. As soon as we ordered food, flying monkeys had called. And I was, so oh, we were like, ah, God. so, you know, what? next time, um, <laughs> but we found a really cool spot. It's called the common good cafe. Mm -hmm. And it uh, had some great craft beer and, and very healthy um, menu, a lot of vegan and gluten free items. Nice. So it was actually really nice. We really enjoyed it. And Sandals was well behaved on a patio. I mean, nice. probably because there was not too many people and no dogs, but <laughs> <laughs> that's always nice to be able to do. I, I try to get Marley out once in a while, but uh, he just barks at everyone. He thinks he needs to protect the sidewalk, protect the patio, protect the people next to us. So they just start barking at anybody. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's nice. Thanos funny. was well behaved there. He was. Yeah, it was good. It was uh, nice. I think he was hot because he's never really where we where we are out in uh, Innisfil here. Our, you've seen our roads is ditches and he, he's never really been in town in Barrie downtown we've never taken him too often so wow. seeing the concrete jungle for the first time he was just wondering where he could piss he's like you know <laughs> where's the grass <laughs> where's the grass where the trees yeah, right. where, where's nature really <laughs> exactly nothing but concrete jungle it's trying to find <laughs> something his pot, poor little paws are probably burning and he's just like, oh, I gotta no. like somebody show me where i gotta go here <laughs> <laughs> a little unsure he's like can i go here am i allowed like guys this is just the road yeah we, yeah, we don't know how, how it works <laughs> either right like we're, we're similar like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's too good it sounds okay. awesome though man hopefully you uh, get out to monkeys uh sometime soon i uh, i know that they were open for breakfast i thought that was the coolest thing ever <laughs> yeah they were doing um those maliko pours from the czech republic and yeah. like the czech for the czech pilsner i guess they're worlds away pilsner and they had a nice breakfast sammy so i'll definitely one day i think probably towards the end of this week i'm gonna hit them up for breakfast because i also love to try nice. the maliko pour as well yeah, that looks really cool. Like, yeah. I, I, I don't know much about that. Like, it just looked neat when I saw it online. I, I recall, and it's going to burn my brain, but one of our guests talked to us about that style of pour before. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who it was. I'm, I'm thinking oh. it might have been Muddy York. Um, yeah, I but can see that. Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't recall, but somebody did mention it. And that's why when I saw it, I instantly was like, oh, that's what that is. <laughs> and it looked really cool with the Fruit Loops in it, too. <laughs> oh, I didn't know there were Fruit Loops. In yeah, that. Andrea <laughs> had poured Fruit Loops in it for the, uh, you know, for the Insta social media picture. And I was like, that's that actually so would awesome. be pretty tasty. <laughs> that's too cool. Mm -hmm. It would be really nice to have, uh, you know, a nice long chat with those folks at uh, Monkeys because they've got so much going on. Uh, even mm -hmm. on IG, I think today I saw there was like two new beers that, that were dropping. There's so much happening it's at that brewery. Yeah, they dropped two seltzers. A seltzers, um, is that what yeah, they were? Two, okay. two seltzers. One's gooseberry. Uh, I can't remember. Gooseberry lemon and something else. And then they mm -hmm. haven't. The other one is uh, a couple different fruits. So fair, it's pretty fair. cool. Yeah. Have so you tried any of those seltzers at all? Like the more craft ones, I guess? I have. I tried. There was like a Dr. Pepper one from uh, Rorschach that I tried. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't keen on it. I think because it's a, a malt it's maltier sometimes yeah. i don't know i'll try the fruit oh, ones Excuse yeah me. yeah but it's i don't know i mean those white claws don't taste that bad <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> no, i didn't say that we'll i that mean <laughs> you're, you're 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 right just that you know from a flavor profile they're really nice just because there's no sugar it just gives a little hint of uh, fruit flavor in it without anything lingering too long right mm -hmm. and, uh, it helps yeah. uh, on the belly that sometimes they're lower cal because of that as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's like drink, those, uh, those gin drinks that Collective does or that, yeah, you know, yeah. like Muskoka does. Like, those mm -hmm. are nice. Gin Smash yeah. is one of my favorites. It's nice on ice. That's from uh, Coll like Collingwood area, I think. But yeah, so I think I'll try more. I'll definitely try yeah. the Two Monkeys ones. But they're, they're a lot of people are doing them. So yeah, like, seltzers are. are huge, right? Yeah, that could be uh, th this summer instead of... Uh, the slushy rush we might see uh the seltzer blitz this summer yeah well I was, i'm excited too i got an invite over to uh, mark uh, shout out to up north brewing um we're gonna catch a garage pint on friday and nice. get to try his home brewed blueberry lemon pilsner oh, oh so yes. fresh oh I, my god right i was like what blueberry lemon pilsner yes i will see you there <laughs> i love that that sounds awesome dude <laughs> yeah it's cool because like i've never really tried too much homebrew i've only tried his and i think two other people's and and his cali common that i had was absolutely amazing so i'm really looking forward to seeing what he's got he even brewed a seltzer too so really i remember him mentioning that yeah. he was gonna do a seltzer what flavor was it that he ended up settling I on i don't recall um 
I'll, oh, have fair, to, fair. I'll have to ask him and share it. But yeah, yeah, he brewed he brewed up a little seltzer for his first time too. And then he was also at People's Pint doing a sumac farmhouse ale uh, yesterday. That's such a cool mix also. So sumac. sumac, there's an ingredient you don't see often, man. That's mm-hmm. incredibly rare. That'd be really nice. I love make. sumac. We get it, yeah, get it. I get it for a spice for a lot of my barbecue and stuff like that. Yeah. It's got a nice little uh, acidity to it that uh, tends well to those kinds of flavors that you'd get in the farmhouse. Yeah, nice. Breaks down the meat nice too. It helps break the meat down. <laughs> That's awesome. Talking so meat. who do we got on the cast today? So we got Tanner joining us from Salter Street Brewery and, and that's on the east end in the Riverside community in Toronto. Um, I'm excited. I had not had any of their beers before Friday and um, we, we got the opportunity to get a little package from them or a great package from them. <laughs> it was little, it was pretty awesome. But <laughs> I, my first beer I had from them, it's, and it's one that started their company. I can't even know if you can see it. There we go. Uh, is that the pills? It looks like it's the pills. Too much bright light today, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> it's also coming with a green screen, but that's the Riverside Copper Pilsner. Um, phenomenal. That beer is phenomenal. That one I could put a case in my fridge, no problem. But uh, <laughs> we're going to learn about their classic styles. Um, you know, they've been around since 2017. So we'll talk about, you know, how they got started. And I'm looking forward to learning all about it. And then we'll tell you who we got next week. I know I'm super excited for next week's guest, too. So me, too. Awesome. Well, Robin, again, cheers, motherfucker, to 50 episodes. (laughs) Excuse my language, Kevin. Um, (laughs) Hey, it's a celebration. It's a a celebration. celebration, (laughs) Thank you, everybody, for listening, and I hope you enjoy this. Cheers. Cheers. (laughs) (laughs) So, Ryan, I I missed that. You you guys are talking about the Japanese lager there. Is that right? Is that? Uh, Yeah. Yes, that's this guy. I got, I got a question for you, Tanner. Uh, this sure. one was it ever a part of like a series? Like, was it the After Hours series? Or yeah, yeah. So, okay. so it started out as like so After Hour, the After Hour series, which has now been rebranded as our Salter Session series, um, is our one-off brands that we do. So that's kind of one of the ones where we play around, have more fun with it. And when we released this last August, the customers went nuts for it. So it, it became like a like it came to the point that every other day, okay, when's it coming back? When's it, when's it coming back? So we were lucky enough to actually find room in the schedule and make it a full-time beer. Wow. I, I can see why it was so popular. I was telling Ryan, I tried this one last year and it was just so crisp and fresh. It was so delicious. Well, like, as I was saying to Ryan, uh, the whole kind of story behind it was, it was me and two of my other sales reps. We were arguing, okay, what's the best like Japanese beer? This was like in like the the full lockdown of COVID because we all miss like all you can eat sushi and all that kind of stuff, right? So my place, I I crush multiple pitchers of Sapporo when I'm there, when I'm doing it. (laughs) And uh, always Ubering, never driving. And uh, we we were started arguing over who makes the best Japanese beers. Is Sapporo, is it Asahi? And it said, okay, well, let's let's try our hand at it, right? That's so cool. That's awesome. Obviously, it turned into this amazing project and this incredible beer. Well, I think that's some of some of the, how the uh, best beer projects are. It's just talking, you know, what do you think is going to work, or you know, what's going to be make a better beer, and uh, what what do you like to drink? That's kind of where we stem a lot of it from, right? Yeah, yeah. And this one's too. It's it's unique too in that the style of lager, whether you get the, the fruitiness to it, it it plays well with today's um, you know palate and the the desire to have a lot more floral beers especially with the the hoppy ipas when you get these more floral lo- um, lagers and pilsners it definitely plays a lot better with that uh, that style that's out there maybe making it a better seller in that regards too so like, I, like i don't know how you guys keep up because i can barely keep up with what's left or right of the post with beer anymore it's it's constantly changing and i do this professionally right so there's there's a lot out there and i will say from a consumer standpoint and for somebody who enjoys beer it's been nice to see what's been happening um you know for coming from a a time period where ryan and i used to really just enjoy west coast ipas because that's really what was out there on the market you know hops were really just for bittering at that time you didn't see too much use of aromatic hops and then Mm -hmm. transitioning over to you know i guess what we call like the new england ipas of those hazier juicier fruitier lower ibu ipas to now coming to the point where a lot of us beer drinkers who started there are coming back to some of those west coast ipas coming back to some of the lagers just because we kind of look for that like perfect simplicity and it, it and i don't want to i don't want anybody to think that these are simple beers 
they're, they're not in any sense simple beers, but it's just simplicity in its perfection. That's so hard to do. And you guys kill it with those beers, just so delicious. Well, like in my, in my opinion, like um, things like a German Hellas or like a proper Czech Pilsner, I don't know if you guys um, like have ever heard the phrase from art school, like the praying hands. No. So apparently like in art school, one of the hardest things you can do is actually do like, this is old school, but like drawing, drawing hands, like the praying hands. It's one of the things that a lot of even old school tattoo artists, they'll base that kind of on your portfolio. Mm-hmm. To, me, to me, that's our equivalent in beer. Yeah. Like a Pilsner check, like the, there's nothing to hide behind. It's so simple, but it, it's, it's brilliant. Right. And, yeah. and that's, and that's it. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so true. And I think that's one thing we forget when we get blown up um, with this just overload of flavors and you, you forget the, sim- the simpleness of uh, the perfect contrast between these noble type hops and the malts and, and how that just works together. And then the water, the perfection of the water and, and you know, over time, you, you're not trying to blow the palate away, you're trying to perfect, right? And that's, I think, where these styles become so much more relevant as um, the palette of the drinker continues to change because as, as we see these styles come out, slushy beers, fruited lagers, all these different things, <laughs> these my box are just getting intensely better because they're being focused on time over time as you brew them. And by the way, this, this my box is just phenomenal. Thank you. Really great beer. I love the first ingredient on it. Time. <laughs> yeah, that, that that really ties into like the whole Salter Street theme, right? Is is time is a big one for us, right? We take our time trying to figure things out, and uh, the the Maybach that's uh, that's one that we love doing every year. Nice, and that's and that's like old school proper like lagering techniques. Like that's actually like we I brew that back in January to have that ready for March. Whoa! Yeah, that's absolutely that. Now that sounds like you're really putting a lot of work into that sort of a beer. So it's 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 time it's effort but it's it's if it's not done that way it's not going to taste the same that's just the way i feel about it so fair enough, fair enough. makes sense oh, now, Tanner, um i was just going to say for for our listeners uh why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us who you are uh my name's Tanner. i'm the brewmaster of salter street brewery uh not really much to know i just kind of brew the beer and and have fun while i'm doing it that's so awesome <laughs> that. and uh tanner the brewery itself you folks have really been brewing some classic beer styles for quite a few years what drove salter street to kind of focus on those more classic styles rather than i i, I don't, don't want to say the hype but what was just kind of the more trendy beers so so kind of like it, there's a there's a kind of a two-part story to this so when i was hired originally and i've been there pretty much since the beginning once the construction was done uh, when I was when I was hired to Salter Street Brewery, the original business model was actually to just brew that copper pilsner. That was all we wow. were going to do, and uh, we had a little pilot system. We were going to kind of do some one-offs. Um, I knew from the get-go that wasn't going to work. Um, so the first thing I did when I kind of took over as the brewmaster was actually really paid attention to what was happening in the neighborhood, because I think it was like three other breweries in the East End opened up like within a month before we did and then another Whoa. three opened up within like a year after oh, so it was a very <laughs> happening very crazy kind of time and i would spend my afternoons actually just going to the different breweries and seeing what everybody else was doing because i didn't want to step on anybody's toes like i knew that we wanted to have kind of our own story mm-hmm. and our own kind of interpretation and this is again getting into some of those hype beers where everybody was kind of focused on sours and uh, at that time, when we first opened in 2017, a lot of saisons, that was really heavy. Um, so we kind of veered away from that and just kind of focused on, okay, how do we do our interpretation of beer? Just kind of twist on classic things. So kind of the mantra has been, this is beer that if you've been drinking craft beer for 10 years, you're going to be familiar with it. You're going to know it. But if you're new to it, it's a little bit different and it's got that those subtle twists so it's almost like homages to traditional but it's the way we interpret beer and it almost seems like uh, you know i don't want to say that your your beers tell a story or the cans on them tell a story about the beer but they almost speak to the personality of the beer like whenever you look at these cans they've got a little something on them that says what this beer may be and what this beer is not what uh, kind of drove you folks to put those on the cans so I got, I got to give full credit to Anne. She's our creative director. Um, she's the one that she's the one who actually designs all of her labels. She works in the tap room as well. Um, she's the one that really like puts the, the, the heart and soul. And I mean, I, I produce the beer, but 
it's 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 the presentation she's the one that kind of really drives that home and it was one of those things again where you're describing trying to create beer that's not quite traditional well we can tell you everything that our beer isn't but <laughs> until you taste it you don't really know what it is you know what i mean yeah no i absolutely love that true enough I, the, the styles to me remind me even though i wasn't drinking beer in my childhood i um grew up in Creemore on weekends and every other yep. Thursday. So when I think of that Copper Pilsner immediately, I think of what going by the brew house, which was on Main Street back then, you can see the big copper fermenters. And, and when I see Copper Pilsner, it just, it brings that kind of nostalgia to me. When I had my first sip, it was that nostalgia. And I think that's what I love a lot about the styles that your team is brewing is that there's a nostalgia attached to them and, and it brings back memories to, people new and old and I, I can imagine you know the the wide variety of consumer that you have coming in is probably feeling the same like you have this Bach for example that it just reminds you of a beer of years past we, we've we've definitely casted a bit of a wider net as opposed to um, some of the craft breweries that have really kind of got their niches kind of down um, so again appealing to a wider audience but again, it, it's still, it's craft at the end of the day. I mean, it's all handcrafted. Uh, we, we work hard to make sure that, you know, it's to the best quality we can make it. And, and it's funny, this, you know, not, not only classic beers, but if I can talk about the location, because you're talking about being on the west end, or the east end of Toronto, you folks have like really unique and interesting location. Like it almost has like an up uh -huh. north, you know Muskoka field to, yeah have you guys been to the brewery or? no we haven't i've only seen pictures but it looks okay. so wild man yeah no um uh, we're actually we're really lucky so uh when john sterling he's the owner of the brewery when we were scouting for a location we were fortunate enough we found the building that we're in 31 salter street mm -hmm. and we found out afterwards the history after we took it over that the building's been there for all, over 100 years mm -hmm. at one point which is really hard to find in, in toronto um, at one point it was actually, it was, um, like a, like a horse carriage kind of storage. Uh, we found it, it was actually served as a munitions factory during world war II. Oh, wow. Um, it's, it's, we've got a full, like, kind of like, we, we were lucky enough to reach out to the local, like historic society. They gave us like a whole kind of file on the building that we're in. Whoa. Um, that's so cool. we, so, so it's, it's a very kind of cool, unique building. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to kind of retrofit it to make it our own. Um, so yeah, it does have that kind of cottage feel. It's also, it's, it's kind of weird to find because we are, we're not, we're just off of Queen Street. So we're kind of ducked down this kind of weird kind of alley that if you didn't know, like walking down, it's like, there's no way there's a brewery down there. Um, <laughs> even to this day, we've got people, even to this day, we've got people in the neighborhood. I was serving customers today and uh, they said they, they've lived in the neighborhood for tw uh, 10 years and we've been there for, we're going on our fourth anniversary this September. Yes. And they said, we didn't even know you were here. Crazy. Wow. Right? Okay. sounds like it's just tucked away on the side there now uh if you can tanner can you tell us a little bit about some of i don't necessarily like to always use the word core but can you tell us a little bit about the more regular beers that yeah. people can expect to see at your brewery so for us we kind of have like our four core number one our, our flagship this is our bread and butter what we started with is our, our riverside pilsner which is the copper pilsner uh number two would be our english ale it's about bloody time um, that's an old school English ale that's actually got a really cool kind of story rooted in rooted in the into the neighborhood why we produce that. Uh, our third beer would be our Paradox IPA, which is a, a more of an easy drinking IPA. And then finally would be our Wurz and Clanks, which is the Japanese lager that we've made a full-time beer actually just last month. That's going nice. forward. So that's not what it's not really coming through with my new light. <laughs> let me see if i can so you said that the it's about time about bloody time has a unique story so the english ales are just another classic style beer but why don't you tell us a little bit about the story behind it's about time well if you had told me three years ago that like my number two beer would be an esb i would have said there's no way especially in today's market of slushy <laughs> beers and all that um but no it was so where we're located at 31 salter street we found out uh, located in the 1800s, about three blocks away from our physical building, was this uh, was a brewery that used to make a beer called uh, Crystal Ale. Um, okay. So it was the uh, I can't remember the name of the brewery. It, it escapes me at the moment. But uh, it was a really cool project. So I actually reached out to um, Bill White, who was my beer history professor at Niagara College, and he was able to actually dig out some of these old records from the 1800s, so we could see wow. what the excise taxes were. So we did our best, me and him, to actually replicate this beer that was brewed 200 years ago about three Whoa. blocks from my current brewery 
Awesome. That's yeah. incredible. Wow. That, there's nothing cooler than being able to attach um, community history to what you do and, and bring out what was there 100, 200 years ago. And, and it's hard to replicate. We've talked to uh, breweries before that have, mm -hmm. Henderson, for example, tried to do the same with their best. So yeah. were you just kind of going off of a similar concept of what kind of malts and grain bills would have been available at that time? Or did you have kind of a, a recipe that you were able to build off of? So we, I was fortunate enough just through, uh, through Bill, he had really good records of kind of what was around at the time. Um, and we were able to, fortunately enough, one of our malt suppliers, they were actually starting a new heritage history project where they were actually starting to replicate producing the malt like they did back in the 1800s. Mm, that's so that's cool. That's cool. And, uh, yeah. the, and the name, it's the, it was the Davies Brewing Company was the name of, name of the, uh, the brewery. Oh, nice. Mm. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah, I love it. It's, as, as a history buff, it's always cool when you find that uh, really unique attachment, the, the age of the building. Um, hmm. which would bring me to ask, has there uh, any ghost stories being given the age of the building? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't heard any yet. I've, I've asked that question multiple times, but no, I have not heard anything as of yet. And nobody on your team has, has said anything as of yet either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no brewery <I'm>, ghosts. <laughs> I mean, I'm in the building probably by myself more than anybody else. And yeah, trust me, I haven't seen any ghosts yet. No, no floating cans or anything. Okay. No. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, given the history, because yeah, the East end is, is so, super gorgeous too. And um, I know a few friends that live on that side and I just love walking down the old areas and, and you don't know the history, but you can kind of feel the history that's in those buildings. So when we can make it, when we make our stop over there, I'm looking forward to it um, and but, kind of seeing it there. I, I mean, it's super polarizing because I grew up in the East End of Toronto and uh, it's so funny because everybody, if you're from the East, like from the, like I'm from Scarborough, so like the real East End, they'll say, oh no, no, you're downtown. But then <laughs> other people, it's like, no, no, you're, you're East of the river. No, no, you're not, you're not downtown. You get like, it's very polarizing depending on who you talk to, where, where my brewery is located. <laughs> it's funny you say that, Tanner. I tell people, like, just for simplicity's sake, when they ask, they're like, where, where are you at in Toronto? And I just say downtown. They're like, oh, where, where downtown? And I say, well, Ossington and Blue. They're like, that's not downtown. That's no, like it's West, West, West End. End. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's downtown for me. I'm from Minnesota. Exactly. I look at the map of Toronto, and when there's giant buildings, that's downtown. <laughs> and, and then you get some of these people that, you know, every, you know, the, the world dies of, uh, uh, east of Vic Park and you know you know you go west of Young Street no nothing exists over there and, that, and then that's Burlington you know that's just how it works that's hilarious. yeah the, the way I would look at it if it's it's east west or north south it's not both unless you're really trying to be complex yeah. <laughs> north north of the 400 south of the 400 east of the valley or west of the valley that's the way I've looked at it and I'm an outsider I don't know if I'm right or not <laughs> so too I'm, fun with some of the styles you have, so we have some classic, we were talking about the classic styles, but um, one of the ones that I'm going to open it right now, because I'd love to talk a little bit about it. We are celebrating our 50th episode with you today. So cheers. Oh, awesome. Yes. I'm honored. Thank you. Yes. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. I, I just got, I was doing some editing. I was like 50. Holy smoke. So <laughs> you, you, um, not al alongside your core program and some court, some seasonals we'll talk about, you have a great barrel aging program, which includes Krampus which we'll talk about, but we have the uh, Chardonnay Barrel Age Belgian Triple. Yeah, so, the, uh, pro the uh, Project Parallel. Project Parallel, yeah. So maybe you want to tell us a little bit about this beer while I'm giving her a pour. And a yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, so Project Parallel is a way for us to take beer. So how that starts out is we release a, a one-off, and then we, we hold some of that back and we barrel age it. Um, so the idea with Project Parallel is to kind of give you, again, another interpretation of the same beer. And, and what we try and do too is before we release that would we'll actually we hold some of the original cans back and try and release them together so that way people can kind of get that same dual experience so you can kind of do the side by side i really enjoy doing flights and uh, drinking beer of different vintages or side by side so it's, it's another cool way to kind of just see how you can take the same beer and do it a couple different ways so yeah. that particular that particular beer was actually our anniversary beer our third anniversary beer that was a Belgian triple that we that we laid down for six months in brand new uh, Chardonnay oak barrels. Wow, that is unreal! I can't wait and to see the color. And, and, and I'm actually very surprised the beer that you poured there because normally we don't get a lot of great head retention with a lot of the barrel projects. So that looks fantastic. Oh, I one of the things from uh, that I learned, uh, especially thankfully to the Belgian beers back in the day, was they taught you how to pour a beer on the label. Most of them, so <laughs> yeah, they, 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 you had to force some of it sometimes. But no, it's looking nice. 
the uh I, the I, chardonnay comes through really beautifully oh it came up beautifully. it's got that nice kind of light toasted uh european oak in there uh Ooh. that was th th those were chardonnay french oak barrels that we brought over Ooh. um and it just i think it just helped help, like it it doesn't smack you over the head with with oak or barrel it just it balances so nicely it elevates like they work so well together it elevates the triple and elevates the barrel it does yeah i would agree because sometimes the triple can have a little bit of that not acidity but there's a little bit more of a, a booze burn to it maybe yeah and that really seems to disappear with the the chardonnay barrels too like there's it's just super smooth yeah ninja alcohol that's what we call that ninja alcohol i love that i haven't heard that one yet <laughs> uh, that's those sneaky 10 percenters <laughs> uh, especially our, our like our barrel program especially with krampus because we temp, tend to brew that around 10 percent, like at christmas time it, it goes down way too easy <laughs> yeah it really does I, I krampus i only had a chance to try actually at this year but i tried the 2019 version Okay. Um, I tried the standard and then the Buffalo Trace. Oh, the bourbon, in. yes. Yeah, that one as well. So this idea that you have of having, or the concept of having a beer that's side by side with kind of like a barrel aged version of it, you've actually even kind of ran mm. with Krampus. And I, I rumor is that next year might be like a Jamaican rum barrel aged version. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's, right? it's been it's it's been laying down in a Jamaican rum barrel since uh, since December. Oh. That's so gonna we're, not, be so we're, we're, we're probably not going to pull that until, um, believe it or not, the Krampus program, we have that designed out, I think, until like 2017. Whoa. Like we've, we've got everything figured out that what we, what we want to do, what we want to achieve. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's like, that's like, uh, that was a, a project that the boss or uh, John was really adamant about that he wanted, um, the rules were he wanted something called Krampus. And from there, we, I kind of ran with it. Um, so yeah, we. Um, I love the rules. Where it's, yeah, that's a simple rule. It's got to be called Krampus. Yeah, yeah that's oh. it. That's it. Just do what you want. You got to call Krampus. But yeah, no, it's it's evolved into a thing where we started in 2017, where we made a 50 liter 50 liter keg of this beer, to now that being a two to four barrel program on top of everything else we produce for it. Wow. So it's it's gotten its own very big cult following, um, and we're also very fortunate prior to COVID that the uh, Opera House, they actually do a Krampus ball on December 5th every oh, year wow. for Krampus night. Mm. So we actually, we, we, we throw a, a like a Krampus kind of pre-party forum where people actually come in dressed like Krampus and they, they get, <laughs> and it's become a verb now where you get Krampus. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so. And that's that ninja alcohol part of the Krampus. <laughs> yeah. That's it, sneak up on you. That, yeah. that is fantastic. What a, what a really kind of unique way to do it too. Like I love how, how is it, is John is the owner? John is the owner, John, yes. yeah, I love how he's just like, here's the name, go nuts. And, you know, <laughs> what you come up with. I love it. And I think the, you know, you talk about too, Robin kind of touched on it, the idea of being able to take a beer and, you know, like the triple, because I did see the cans of the triple on the website as well, like the Belgian triple. So I love how yeah. you can, you're offering the original version beside mm -hmm. this barrel age version for the consumer to kind of sort through on their own and, and see, oh, where do I find, where, what flavors am I finding of the Belgian? Um, now, has anybody ever tried to maybe mix those two together? Cool. I, I haven't heard of that yet. I hope not. <laughs> That's <laughs> I've, I've, heard, I've heard a fair bit of um, like our summer beer, the lime wit. I've heard a lot of people um, doing uh, like throwing a shot of gin into that and then, and then going to town. But um, other than that, you know, I haven't heard too much of, uh, of, of mixing the beers together. Mixing the beers together. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in that case, they're, they're really meant to be independently enjoyed and appreciated for, for what they offer. Because especially in the case of the Krampus, like they, they, even though the base was the same in the one that I tried, which was 2019, and correct me if I'm wrong, that was the Imperial Stout. Is that right, that one? Because that was 20... it. 20... Or is it 2020 was, was Russian, the quad? 20, 20, 2019 was Russian Imperial State, 2020 was the Belgian quad. Yeah. And with, with that one, I mean, the, the flavor profile was very uniquely different on both. And I, and I imagine if I mix some of the, the bourbon barrel age version with the regular one, it would just kind of dilute the, the bourbon barrel yes. age flavor and it would take a little bit away from that, that standard Imperial Stout as well. Because they were both delicious, but I can see it taking away from both. Well, and the other thing that we do too that we find um, 
because they're not just straight a Russian Imperial Stout or a straight Russian uh, Belgian quad. They're actually they're spiced with um, uh, like your typical Christmas spices. So you get your orange, your orange peel, your cardamom, all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. right? Um, it, it's actually the original version was we took the spice spill out of actually uh, my godmother's uh, mulled wine recipe. We just, literally just took the oh. spices and threw into an Imperial Stout. That wow, was, that's so to me, cool. there's nothing that scream. There's nothing that screamed more Christmas to me than like I I could picture being in the distillery district getting a glass of mulled wine. There's yeah. nothing more Toronto than that at Christmas time, the Christmas yeah. market, right? Yeah. So that was our way to kind of tie back into the city. That is too so we, cool. So we, we so we've done the we've done the mulled wine spices in the, in every version of Krampus. We've just altered it slightly depending on the oh. beer that we need, need to suit. Yeah. So there's yeah. for example the original the original one it was very heavy on the star anise and. Um, and the nutmeg, and then we dialed that down. And then the 2019 version, we went very heavy on the orange peel because we knew that was going in the bourbon barrel. So heavy on the cinnamon and the orange peel because we knew the vanilla and the oak barrel was going to come through. So there's there's a lot of lot of work moving parts to try and figure this stuff out, right? That's a heck of a science. Now, I, I want to take it back for or just a moment because you started with these core beers that we now see or the these beers that your customers can always expect to see there. What prompted your folks to get into a barrel age project altogether? Because I imagine, like, at least from what me and Ryan have heard, that this is a whole different type of science, if you can even call it that in and of itself. So for me, the whole barrel age program came with me being part of the brewery. I've loved a barrel age beer. I actually, uh, when I went to, I was one of the early classes of Niagara College. And oh, wow. uh, to take a step back in, in my career, um, I'm actually third generation in the, in the alcohol business. So oh, my, wow. my, my father spent, uh, he's retired now, but he spent o- over 40 years working between um, the LCBO and a couple different wineries as a consultant and all that kind of stuff. And then my grandfather was actually a distiller back in Denmark. Oh, cool. Um, so when I worked, or when I went to Niagara College, the barrel program was pretty weak, but because my father was consulting for a winery at the time, I had access to barrels. Mm-hmm. So I started bringing barrels to Niagara College to help so it's something that I've always, because to me, that's the magic. Because yeah. It doesn't matter how, how good you are. And I'm, and I've, uh, I saw the podcast you, you guys did with Money York. He kind of sums it up the best. Yeah. You put the bear, you put the beer in the barrel, the magic happens. And then it's just kind of <laughs> hurry up and wait. And then you see what comes out. Right. Dude, yeah. That is so, so something ambitious. That I've, pardon? That's so ambitious as a student to, to move into like, Oh my goodness, dude, that's too cool. Like you think most students, especially at a beer college would be trying to, just do something basic and get it done. But man, you were experimenting with wine barrels. That's out of control. Yeah. So we, uh, well, that's something, like I said, I've, every brewery I've ever worked at, I've always been involved with barrel aging beer at some point or another. Right. So it's something with Salt Street because I have a lot more creative control. Um, it's, it's actually pushing. And that's one of the things that we hope to kind of move forward with is doing a lot more of this kind of stuff in it at a more regular interval. So right now, I think we only do maybe two or three barrel releases a year. I'd like to get that up to about uh, one every two months, so about six releases a year. Wow. Oh, wow. That'd be yeah. really wild. Really increasing the program because, like you said, it's a hurry up and wait, um, you know, and, and it's you, a barrel could sit there for six months. It could sit there for 18 months before it's decided yeah. it's ready for you to do something with it. So it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of ambition adding more barrels and not, not knowing the timeline either, right? Because it's hard to wanting to commit to say like in every two months yeah you can't rush the process there's it's not like making an ale where you can yeah. you can you know make it you know, fit, pretty damn 15, quick yeah, yeah 15 days start to finish right yeah <laughs> um but but for us i think the thing with what we do too is it's yes there is a little bit of mixed fermentation but that becomes naturally out of whatever the spirit that previously like we don't purposely inoculate with addi- additional stuff the idea mm-hmm. with the barrel program is the barrel is supposed to highlight the beer. We don't design the beer around the beer. Like, you know what I mean? It's that mm-hmm. back and forth, right? Yep. Yeah. And and we kind of figure out when it's ready and, and we go from there, right? Um, it's not like that deep, complex Belgian, you know, lambic where we're taking three or four years to figure it out, right? It's, yeah. it's a little bit faster to turn around because otherwise we're sitting on vinegar for a year and a half before it finally actually turns good, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure enough. I like the idea you said, like, you're just looking for that really, it's that the simple complexity is like what barrel will really complement that beer versus okay now what can we do after it's been in the barrel to maybe add more to it to 
you know, all these adjuncts that go into it. When you get a beer like this Project Parallel one, you have the uh, triple, it's, it speaks for itself, right? Like that's, that's what I love about what you're talking about with the barrels, just let it speak for itself. And, and, and then that, do its work. that's, that same barrel that the Chardonnay's and the Beer de Mars, I think I sent you guys a can of that. Yeah. Uh, so those same barrels we pulled the Chardonnay out of, we put the Beer de Mars back in those exact same barrels. Ooh. Oh, cool. Because I, I'm a firm believer that you can get multiple turns out of a barrel. Oh, yes. That you can, yeah. You, you, can, you can build flavor back in. I know a lot of guys, unfortunately, that they use a barrel once. Okay, cool. Now it's patio furniture where it's, we try and get <laughs> as much use as we, as we possibly can. That's well, a really brilliant way to utilize that. I mean, at least get your, you know, your, your primary that you wanted out of that and then still be able to use it for a few other beer runs, maybe that you're not using to age for as long. That's wild. It's like cooking well, that, with a that, skillet. That, cramp, that Krampus bourbon that you had, um, if I told you that was a third use bourbon barrel, would you believe me? Whoa, I would have never thought, man, that uh, bourbon flavor comes through beautifully in that, like the vanilla notes in there play oh. so well. Do you think after... <laughs> A second use, let alone a third use, some of those would start to mute out. Yep. Wow, that is incredible. So a question on that, just because, I mean, just from a, a barreling perspective, would a third use take a little longer for it to be ready just to pull the flavors yep. out of the barrel? Okay, that's what I was Ab wondering. And absolutely, and, and at that stage too, because we know we're going into that with a deeper, like a Russian Imperial Stout, we're not, at this stage we're not actually looking for the bourbon because there's already enough flavor packed in the beer we're looking more for that raw oak flavor so we, mm -hmm. and, and for those beers I age for a year anyway so we know we, we were going to get that out of there nice now i wanted you mentioned the beer and i did want to talk about not only the beers but the series as well so you, you mentioned the beer to mars but yep. the style beer we don't very see very often mm -hmm. um but it's also a part of something really cool that i found on your website the salter session series Yep. where um, you have recently created, your, you and your team have recently created a uh, video series going through tasting notes and talking yep. about the beer, which I think is super fantastic. It's just a, it's a great way for a beginner or expert to learn about the beer. So maybe tell us a little bit about this beer, but also this, maybe we'll talk about the series after and that how it's kind of, it, you know, it's growing into this release. Yeah. Well, the, the I mean, I mean, the beer itself, uh, a beer to Mars is for me, that was something I only ever really read about in school. Um, not a lot of people, I think before I produced that, I think I'd only ever really had two in my life. And one was actually locally produced by um, Little Beast Brewery in Whitby. Yeah. They did one a couple of years ago. And uh, one of the biggest complaints we got, like, because we always take customer feedback, but the fact that our dark beer program kind of ended off so it made sense to kind of produce something that would kind of kind of tide us through the through the spring into the summer. Yeah. Um, so beer to Mars made sense. Um, again, not a lot of commercial examples. So kind of swinging for the fences, hope, hoping it lands. <laughs> um, luckily, touch wood, the uh, feedback's been really good about it. Um, but yeah, That's but like kinda... I said, it, it's it's still it's still moving pretty well. So it's got to be interesting to not really have a, um, a comparative when you're brewing, right? Like you said, no, I, I, I had to look up what beer to Mars was I, and I haven't tried it yet. And I'm looking forward to, but to not really have a, something to taste and compare to, like you said, you had maybe one or two. Um, how do you go into that as a, as a brewer kind of, you know, what do you look for with, if you don't really have a precursor to look for? So you, you do do a lot of research on turn, like on top of just like what the BJCP says or the, the, the BA, which is the Brewers Association guidelines. Uh, for me, a lot of my stuff, especially when I'm digging into uh, historic styles like this, is really kind of delving into the history of it. So thinking about what ingredients would have been available, kind of get into that mindset of, okay, how, how would I brew this? It was, you know, back in the 1700s, right? Yeah. And then shy of, you know, because traditionally that style of beer, that was that was the last runnings that they would kind of drink quick while they're waiting for like beer to guard to be done. So, you know, shy of burying it in the field and, you know, throwing hay on it. I mean, you kind of, you kind of do the best you can, right? That's too good. I love it. And, and the series itself. So another one I have in front of me is the Sasquatch cream ale, which comes uh, with the Sasquatch. softer session. Yeah. You're a big fan. You love the Sasquatch. I, 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 you know what? I love the story behind it. I love how it's, you know, I'm, I'm a big, um, I'm a big Canadian patriot, as it were, if there is such a thing. Um, I love the fact that we finally have our own hop. I've been now the 
po- I think I've been the poster child for the Sasquatch hop ah, two years in a row. Yeah, okay. That's why it's called Sasquatch Cream Ale. Yeah, so we use, we use that. Uh, we brewed that with our buddies down at uh, at uh, Hops Connect because um, they're the uh, they're the guys that, that grow the Sasquatch hop. So, but the Salter Sessions kind of delve into the series is because we don't brew the most traditional styles of beer, or I mean, or we do, I guess, but like with our twist on it, we get a lot of questions. So this was a better way to connect with our customers, connect with the audience, kind of tell them what we got going on. Um, and it's also, it's a way, because we're a very small team at Salter Street. So there, there's me, there's Rob, there's Ange, and there's Owen, and then there's John, the owner, that's pretty much it. So it's a better way for us to kind of have our faces in front of the, in front of the business, right? So that way you just don't see the clock logo. It's more, it's, it's a family business in that sense. You know what I mean? I love it. Tie the people to the, uh, you know, to the beer, right? It, it, it brings out a whole other aspect um, as a beer drinker, when you can see who's making it and, and who's creating the, the labels and, and who's, you know, helping out with this, like you said, this small family business, it really brings a different tangibility to what you're drinking. I love it. Like I said, the four people I mentioned, if you came to my tap room tomorrow, you will be dealing with one of us. That's it. Wow. Right. That's crazy. Such a small team and it, but it's that family thing too, right? You said it creates such a family experience. You're, you're all four people who came together and are working in this place and you create this great family experience. And I'm sure when you walk into the building, it's no different than watching how you, you interact on the Salter sessions, which is just like watching a bunch of people have fun and hanging out. Well, I, I mean, I think that also speaks to the beer too, because it is a very collaborative, rep, collaborative effort, right? Like Rob runs our tap room. Um, he's dealing with the customers day to day. Owen is our general manager and, um, and our sales rep. So he's on the road. So the licensees know, know us through that. I'm the one brewing the beer. Angie's the one designing our label. So again, it's, we all, but we, we all collaboratively kind of come up with some of this stuff, right? And Tanner, can I ask you, like, obviously last year with COVID, it affected so many breweries. How did Salter Street feel the impact of COVID? <laughs> COVID. Uh, I thought we were over this by now. We um, <laughs> your, your patio's open. We're, we're <laughs> your over it. <laughs> patio, patio just got open, thank God, last Friday. Yes. Um, and you know what? Anybody who's watching this, thank you so much for anybody who showed up on the patio. We really appreciate anybody who's been coming out. Um, COVID was a very interesting switch for us because um, we did a couple things with COVID. So prior to COVID, believe it or not, most of our business was licensee. So we sold a lot of kegs to bars. We had our tap room, but our beer to go was, was a very small percentage of the business. We went and did a complete 180 and with most of the business now being canned beer going out to, out to go with the bars being closed. But at the beginning of COVID, one thing that we did, um, cause we weren't sure what was going to happen. We actually, I was fortunate enough that I'm good buddies with uh, Dawn at Last Straw Distillery out in Vaughn. Um, we actually, we refit the business. So we operated for almost two and a half months where we were actually helping to produce hand sanitizer. Oh, Oh, wow. That's amazing. Nice. So we, uh, we, by the end of it, I think we helped produce almost 10,000 liters of hand sanitizer. Oh, Um, fantastic. And, uh, that all went to, went to hospitals and, and, uh, old age homes and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and believe it or not, we didn't actually, we didn't make a dollar off of it. I was just us donating our time and doing all that. So. That's incredible. Good for you. For, fortunately enough for us, um, Dawn was good enough to help us like recost the cost of the ingredients. But other than that, everything else was like donated to Salter Street. It was just it was our time, and then John, you know, put the bill for the facility. So, jeez. Wow. I mean, it, one thing it must have done, Tanner. This the whole stint through COVID must have been that uh, it hopefully open you folks up to a new audience mm-hmm. because a lot of people now have kind of shifted from just going to a brewery and pick up the beers to now being able to have this incredible selection of beer that they can order online oh that well that's a big part of it i mean a big one for us especially being where we are in toronto is uber eats is huge for us i think Mm -hmm. i think i go through more bags of chips than uh (laughs) than anything else i never i love that law whatever law that is that's one of the best laws to come out of covid you can sell small bags of chips as long as you you can sell beer it's just as long as you sell miss vicky's (laughs) 
I, you know, like like I said, I, I think I like the fact that I've now have the uh, the old Dutch uh, truck have to stop by the brewery to drop off the cases a week. You know, we we, we hit on something there. I love it. I love it because we had um, uh, Evan from the craft bottle shop on recently um, in Barry, the newest bottle shop, and that's when I go in, he's like, remember, you got to buy chips. I'm like, that's fine. You know, <laughs> you have to just, just make sure you get some more flavors in because I'm, I'm tired of barbecue and all dress. Like we need, some, we need some more chips, but it's an interesting, like COVID has created some interesting, unique opportunities too, for, for you to be able to sell beer and circumvent I don't know whatever laws yeah, the, were or weren't uh, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm um, hopefully the AGCO doesn't n- nothing personal, guys. Hope the AGCO doesn't tune onto your channel here because you know there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are going on. So, oh, um, we'll, but we'll yeah, just no, it, blurt it's, that out. <laughs> it's it, well, it, it's just it's just very interesting how um, my the only thing that I can kind of worry about is I don't know how you put any of it back in the bottle. They've opened it up and made it so liberal for so many people. Mm-hmm. I don't know when COVID ends, how you change that. They can't. Yeah, you know? I don't think they so can. that's the only, uh, you're going to crippling thing I can wonder to about, do right? that. Like you're going to, like, I think, I, I hope not because they, it's like you basically created almost free enterprise inside the, the alcohol system well, with the changes that they made. And that's where it should be. <laughs> well, there, there, there are so many things that just made sense that are natural, right? So yeah. it's like, for example, you know, like a hotel bar, right? If you check into the hotel late at night, you go and have a, have a, you know, your last meal, being able to buy a six pack and go back to the room. That makes total sense to me, right? Because the mm-hmm. beer store and liquor stores are already closed. Yeah. These are basic things. But, you know, then again, there's, there's other things that are a little, a little ridiculous with, uh, with some of the, some of the bottle shops running some of the specials they're doing, but Hey, Hey, again, it's free enterprise. You got to make the money how you can, right? Well, that's like Saskatchewan. I always revert my um, my first time experiencing off sale. You know, we leave the bar at 1.30 a.m. and you buy a six pack from the bartender on the way home and say, what? <laughs> you can do that? Like you can buy a pack of smokes too, if you want. <laughs> like, <laughs> if it suits your fancy, but, you know? So, so when we saw that, when we saw what that would happen, you know, and these, these kind of, they didn't change, but they bent very yeah. exponentially. Um, I hope that, the, I agree with you. I hope that it doesn't change and go back, mm-hmm. but um, when we talk about COVID and we're on the way out, how, how yes, has thank the, God. thank goodness, yes, you obviously haven't, you said your a lot of your business prior to was licensees. So I'm, I'm, I have to assume that you guys are, your team is back to filling kegs. And, yes. Uh, yeah. Licenses yeah, on yeah, the go. yeah. I had, I had to bring those things out of the shed a while ago. Um, <laughs> Did you remember <laughs> how? <laughs> dust, dust them off. Right. Um, but yeah, no, we, 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 we've got, we've got a plethora of legs and we were actually, we were really lucky that a lot of the bars that we were servicing beforehand, they're still in business. Thank God. Um, good for them. Um, that they, they called us right away. So we were able to fill a lot of those patios this weekend. But yeah, no, it's it's a whole new world out there. And uh, like I said, for us, we were we were really lucky that the neighborhood really rallied behind us. Um, they were buying our beer, uh, and yeah, we we turned out okay. You know? Yeah, yeah. We seen you know it's one thing I think the the brewing industry seems to have come through. Honestly, when we were like Robin and I talked about it, even with guests before about six months in, we're like, God, I you know I don't know what it's gonna look like coming out of the year or, or, you know, moving through January, which is typically low buy time anyways. And, and amazingly, we're seeing so many of these breweries who, you know, like yourself, you're, you're still young. You know, you said you're going on year four. We've yep. seen so many of these young breweries make it out of the other end of what is probably one of the biggest economic disasters that, you know, we've seen in our lifetime. It's pretty amazing to show that, you know, how community oriented craft beer is when these small businesses are back to filling kegs, like nothing happened. Oh, well, like I said, no, like, but not to take it for granted. It was a tough, it was, of it's course. been a tough year, right? Of course. So we wanted to talk a little bit about, we talked briefly about you guys getting the patio open. Um, one thing we noticed, and a lot of the folks that we've talked to recently, their indoor space converted quite heavily from being able to house people to storage. canning lines, storage. Yes. So is that is that similar? Yeah, Did you guys, yeah. your team, have to go through well, the same? <laughs> well, so <laughs> the thing about, um, I'm sure you guys know, that when you start a brewery, you start a business, you think, oh, great, I got all this room, then you immediately fill it right up. Um, so even prior to COVID, we were kind of hitting that point anyway. 
Um, but for us to have to flip to everything to like, you know, hundred percent cans, like I'll, I'll tell you right now, currently my tap room has about three pallets of empty cans sitting in it because <laughs> yeah. that's just the reality. And that's the big shift we have is now, okay, hopefully we can get people back in, in October, uh, September, October. So it's how we make that transition. Right. Well, so, I guess it depends on like analyzing between then and now, I guess how much product is yeah going to licensees versus mm -hmm. back into cans because you now have to shift that mindset. You're moving so much product in this can, but now we have to go back to what we were doing before. How much can we keep in, you know, vessel A and how much can we keep in vessel B type thing? Oh, and the, uh, like the other thing we were really lucky about was, was the year prior to COVID, we'd actually just bought our own, our own canning line. So we were still kind of navigating all that kind of stuff. So when, because all the mobile cam canning companies, they're completely slammed right now, right? So we were actually very lucky just to have our own equipment just to kind of keep going, right? Yeah. Been yeah a these few, mobile uh, canning companies definitely had a yeah. They did well through COVID for sure. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So it'd be nice to see people coming in, but it'll be interesting to see how you'll be able to store all those extra cans now and, and uh, <laughs> what I happens. Also think, I also think, though, the customer's um, expectation and perception is going to change a little bit, too. I think... I don't think we're, in terms of a customer being fully com uh, comfortable in a tap room, isn't going to be fully there. I think that's probably going to take another full year after all yeah. this, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's true enough. Time. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess everybody's already careful enough, even with the patios and the rules that are set out. I mean, you know, people have been spacing out pretty carefully, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a, at least a little bit of time before we start to see indoor being the norm again. But, but unfortunately in this business, you know, somebody has one too many beers and then you see how those rules, like we've had to be very vigilant, not, not this round, but the previous summer being very vigilant. Like, no, no, four people to a table. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not, it's not hard to, I remember I went down to Toronto last summer and you just, you run into people and you're, you're here and somebody you yeah. haven't seen is and, five and, tables and over it's like and it's hard as a consumer, but it, you're, you respect it, the it's, brewery. It's, so. it's, it's, it's innocent. It's innocent enough. People don't but it's also, Hey, these yeah. are the rules, right? Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. And it's one of those things that like you just, as a consumer, you have to really respect and appreciate those rules because it's for the betterment of the business. You can't be breaking the rules because it lands on your team and, oh, and sure. you know, your patio closes down or what have you. Right. So, so with all these classic styles, I do want to ask you Tanner, and this was a question we had um, lined up. What's one style you haven't brewed yet at Salter Street that you would like to brew or that we might see you already be preparing to brew? If that's a secret you can release. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was funny, I, I, I read the questions beforehand. So technically, because I ran a pilot system beforehand for the first like year and a half because we only made one beer. Um, the only three styles of beer that I haven't produced at Salter Street is any of those heavy mi mixed fer fermentation lambics uh, a Lechtenheiner, which is like a German sour beer, and a okay. Stein beer. Everything Ooh. else, everything else, I've produced. Really? Wow. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. That's yeah, pretty I mean, awesome. <laughs> yeah, you don't have that much on your bucket list in terms of brewing. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I, I mean, I, I've I've been brewing beer since I was 16 years old. So I mean, I've wow. I've got a long. <laughs> I, I've had a chance to brew a lot of stuff, right? That's Jeez. amazing. Well, wow, I, was, I was expecting like a, yeah, I was like, wow, yeah. well, pretty much. <laughs> I've got done it all. <laughs> That's awesome. So I've heard that. barrel that you've not worked with that, because you've got extensive experience in barrels, man. It goes back. Oh, so yeah. what's a barrel you've wanted to work with that you not yet have a chance to work with? I mean, time or, I mean, time or money, no object. I'd love to get my hands on a Pappy, like a proper Pappy Van Winkle barrel. But I mean, those things are... <laughs> worth got you know how much um i've got uh i i you know i would love one thing i'd love to do not so much a barrel but like a a proper proper barrel system where i'd love to do like a proper solera system like on my own hands like kind of like how they make sherry like you know like that Ooh. you know i'd love to do that with the beer no i don't know that system that well i so oh. so so it's a picture you got three barrels on the bottom two yeah. barrels in the middle one barrel yeah. on the top right okay. so you've got you've got uh You've got the young stuff in the in the bottom, the middle aged stuff in the middle, and the old stuff. But then you slowly rack and you blend and you keep going. That way. Oh, right, like a continue, like a continuous Damn. kind of like ecosystem, right? Yeah, this is something, yeah. That's something that's big with sherry. They do it a little bit with port, 
Um, that's one thing I find too, because like I went to school down in Niagara. There was a lot of techniques I learned with my barrel agent because I was fortunate enough to have a teaching winery next to the teaching brewery. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of crossed those lines. I learned some of the barrel techniques from what they do with wine that a lot of guys won't cross those lines. Um, but again, I think there's a lot of things that are done with distill- distillation that isn't done with brewing that I think there's a lot of techniques that could be easily applied, but not really used. Oh, I like that. See, that's innovating yeah. and evolving the classic and traditional styles. Yeah. Ryan Heights go out or not. I think it's a good <laughs> thing you should be doing. Um, but that that's, that's really cool. I, I, the idea, even I'm just picturing. So when you have this concept of blending them in that regard, similar mm-hmm. to Sherry, is that much different than I say a brewer taking a couple barrels and blending them because barrel, you know, barrel is maybe not there or it's, you know, when you put them together to make a different blended barrel. It, it, it's, it's very much in the same concept, but it's, it's doing it kind of like unified with one project. Uh, you know what I mean? Okay. So imagine being able to take like a, like a barley wine, for example, but then be able to pull from, uh, you know, two year, 16 month, and right. six months full intent right. yeah that makes sense right. yeah that, that would be amazing yeah that, that would be a great idea yeah. <laughs> that'd be super neat to see now the tenor, i gotta I, I, I gotta ask you another question on this i feel like i have so many barrel questions for you would sure. you ever consider at salta street delving into grape ales because there's some breweries i've seen um I, namely one in in toronto burdock really you know focuses hard on the grape ales um mm. where they you're, do these heavy you're, talk, with, you're talking about like wine beer hybrid you got it you got yeah, it yeah, would you me. would you ever delve into that because you were just saying like you had this I've experience you have yeah, oh my goodness <laughs> yes we I've, do, I've done them between two other breweries i did them at uh, i did some trials because i used to work at niagara i used to, not only did i study niagara college i worked in niagara college for a year so i've done beer age on uh great musk i've i've done all that Whoa. um i think my favorite one was uh nate ferguson who's the uh he's one of the partners involved with the scartman labs we brewed a beer together called WTF What the Frunk. Oh, Ooh. nice. <laughs> and, it, and, it was a Bel- it, and it was a Belgian triple age on Cab Franc Musk. Oh. And this stuff, guys, I tell you, it poured purple. Oh my God. Really? The jamminess from that Cab Franc must have played nicely with that. Jeez. Good, good luck cleaning. Good luck cleaning the tank, though, after. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend this. No um, doubt right oh, that's um, too cool but it man. was it was interesting and there was another one we did um it was a uh, it was it was chardonnay musk on a on an, uh, an american pale ale um and then we racked it onto uh onto chardonnay staves and we aged it for four weeks Jesus. Oh, my yeah. goodness oh that man must have been so fresh and crisp my goodness these sound delicious right i'm saying so <laughs> oh and, and one of the things i from from a few people who when i posted they're saying oh tanner is so passionate he's been doing it for so long and he you know he loves what he does what is the craziest funkiest thing you've put together that it sounds like you're, I'm, I'm hearing all these crazy things i'm like all right what is the funkiest craziest okay, the, beer you okay, put together the, the weirdest beer i ever did and this was never for public consumption it was only on, in my homebrew day well not my homebrew days when I was homebrewing when I was in school was um, you, I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, Charlie Papazian. and he wrote he wrote Joy to Homebrewing. It was one of my first. It was one of the first brewing books. If you've ever homebrewed, that's that's like one of the one of the bibles you pick up, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> and um, he had a recipe in there, and it was from a recipe from eighteen hundreds or seventeen hundreds from England. It was called Old Cock Ale, and it was where you boiled your beer and you boiled a chicken in it. <laughs> so it was a way it was a way for them to cook the chicken and then still make beer so i did a rendition once where i did something very similar but it was a thanksgiving beer with turkey cranberry sage what i only i only had about a pint of it before i got rid of it obviously <laughs> um, but everything's fully cooked it's boiled yeah yeah you know what I mean? yeah um it was no head retention because because of the the fat out of the turkey, but of uh, it was it was one of the most interesting projects I've ever done. <laughs> it's like it's like cool. reverse beer can chicken. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> totally the other way around. <laughs> because, because, because if you ask me, like I said, I'm not a big fan of pumpkin beers by any stretch. I was trying to find a new way into that Thanksgiving kind of Halloween market, and yeah. I thought you know turkey beer might be the way to go. I learned. <laughs> That is awesome. That is that's <laughs> too fun. I have never heard of that. That is an interesting one. Boiling your chicken and your beer, folks. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You're doing it backwards. 
kill your beer can and chicken cookers. <laughs> <laughs> that is too fun. I love it. So we we talked about you know the different styles of beers that you guys have, and I wanted to ask um, you know just before we do go into our last set of questions, which is probably not beer related at all. It depends on what Robin and I have geared up for you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, what what can we expect? Um, to see from Salter Street as we move forward post COVID, um, you know, we're going to be looking to continue maybe more product into cans, um, or uh, can we expect something exciting coming from you guys? Maybe an event coming when you're ready to open. Anything you got planned coming up? Well, we're we're really hoping if everything keeps going, everybody keeps getting needles and arms, that we can actually have like a legit anniversary party at the end of September there. That'd oh, be nice. great. Um, I got a, I got a fun, I got a fun beer plans for that, that we're going to do barrel aging as well for the, the following anniversary for a big five year. So that'll be fun. Sweet. Um, in terms of general stuff, um, we're just going to keep kind of doing the Celtic sessions, you know, kind of one-offs whenever we can, uh, expanding the barrel program. That's a big one for me this year. It's a big project, but yeah, I mean, as long as you guys keep drinking it, we're going to keep brewing it. So <laughs> we'll that's keep the big goal. It. That's yeah. it, right? <laughs> and I and like like we said off the top, I and Robin, as you mentioned, I think the palette of the beer drinkers changing, and people are starting to recognize the the viability and quality of these classic style beers. Mm-hmm. And so, so can I throw throw a question back at you guys? I mean, you guys always are, 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 are doing this podcast, and you guys are drinking all these different beers. Obviously, I I feel like from what we've talked about, you guys kind of started drinking beer like at the early craft kind of beer renaissance as, as I did. It's what got me into making beer in the first place. But when did we hit that point when it was just, okay, this isn't beer anywhere. Like we've gone too far. You know what I mean? When did we hit that? When did we hit that point? Oh, 2019. Dude. No, <laughs> no. I feel, I feel for me, it was the introduction of lactose into beers that were, okay. you know, not necessarily stouts or porters, but then we were putting it into like IPAs and stuff. I was like, wait, like this is different now. Like this, this is not the same anymore. That, that's at least what it was for me. Yeah, I can see that. I, yeah, that's tough. I don't know. I I think it evolved so slowly, but yet quickly at the same time, because back when, when we first started seeing hazy IPAs in Ontario, like seven years ago, um, six years ago, that's when they first started coming out a little bit. And it was like, people didn't really know about it. And then all of a sudden it was just bam. And then now it's, it's just, it's like a fast evolution. It's what's the next hottest thing. So yeah, I don't know, really know when it started. It's kind of a blur because I remember my first like left field, um, you know, uh, what's the, uh, what's their hazy IPA, Robin? That's missing laser, show. laser, laser show. show, right? Like in the big bottle. And I remember when we got <laughs> that and that was like, it's haze was still kind of just kind of kicking yeah. the door in a bit. So I would say like maybe like four years ago, three, four years ago, it started to really kind of change direction. Kind of deviate, eh? Yeah. yeah, like I don't know. Like I always, I, and it's funny because I always get trash because I do love a good hazy IPA when I have them. But Robin and I said before we were talking, uh, before you jumped on, that I find as I'm like pushing forty now, they just don't work for my body anymore. <laughs> like it's just I could, they taste great, sure, yeah. but yeah. there's a lot more that I enjoy about having a good, you know, May Maybach or a, or a cream ale, like. Yeah. that's just it's it goes beyond that and I, I don't know I think I think that um, the evolution we're seeing is gonna retract and come back in because yeah. there's only so much you can really push the limits on um, yeah. and you know I've openly stated and I've openly tried them I'm not a fan of slushy beers um, I, I just I get it I can understand why people might like them you know like I remember when fruited sours were really popular in 2017-18 right you'd, you'd get these look, massive look, you're, you're talking you're talking to a guy who put turkey in a beer and I've got a hard time with pastry stout so you can- <laughs> <laughs> right I'm just I hear you I, that's so funny I would probably be more into your turkey beer to be honest so. <laughs> yeah I don't know I I hope we see some reeling in of it but you know what you know what the thing is is and we've talked about this too with other people is as these you know these i like i do call them hype styles i'm I'm not gonna i'm not gonna you know shy away from calling them the hype styles they do bring new beer drinkers into craft beer so as much to say when we were into drinking beer back when you know you could find a shitload more belgians on the shelf at the lcbo than you could craft beer 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, that transition for us was a very different beer palette than what is today, but we found our way to these other styles. Um, so I feel that though the, though the, the limits are definitely being pushed a lot farther out than my palate prefers to taste. I feel that these, these guys that are enjoying, or these people, these, these, these beer drinkers that are enjoying um, these crazy styles are eventually going to come back and be like, wow, this lager is fucking good. Like, <laughs> I think it's the evolution. It's just in reverse from us. <laughs> not for sure well like i said i'm really hoping to see a big resurgence like i'm seeing it already like west coast seems to be really big this summer so far yeah yeah um, I, know, I, I know i i know i got one in the works i'm bringing it next week so that'll be good oh nice um, so yeah that'll be that'll be that'll be fun to see like more cascade on the shelf yeah true and you know like um italian pilsners is another one we're seeing oh, yeah. a lot of which are really great because they have again that floral notes and yeah. it kind of so I, I feel that's why I said earlier at the hop, like the Japanese style lager is one of those ones that it could cater to those hazy boys because uh, hazy boys and girls and people, because it, you know, it has those floral and fruity notes a little bit, right? But it's a lager and it, it brings it back to the malt base and you get more of those traditional lager notes. So I feel that some of these styles will bring people back to what beer really is. Not to say that it's not beer, guys, but you know where I stand. <laughs> where it started, where it started. Where it started. It right back to there, you know. Back to the Rhine Heights, got it. <laughs> so do you have... I, so I, I, I mean, as long as it doesn't go back to like when I was 15, it was only macro luggers and we'll be okay. Right. <laughs> I See, I would kill to see Hefe Weizen's like take off oh. again. That's sorry. That's sorry. You, you, OG you Hayes. Met, you met the wrong brewer for that one. So yeah, no doubt. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a half guy. Like we brew, we brew Belgian wit. We do we do the the sublime, which is the lime wit. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but we yeah wheat beer is not my uh, not, not your forte. Again, again out of out of pre well, just not my personal preference. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorite to start, and I call it the OG haze. You know, that was the original <laughs> haze boy. <laughs> was was it Denison's? My no, my fa my favorite is uh, Jens Steffener. Mm. Uh, it's like that was the first one I tried and it was just like what the hell is this but I can understand yeah. why people don't like it if you don't like bananas you're gonna hate that stuff yeah so before we close off we always like to ask random questions a random sure. question that you had I'm gonna ask again because I want our listeners to hear and it was actually a question I believe it's Ange right that does the uh the interviews the, with you on your yeah team? she's our yeah. creative director yeah. yeah so she had asked off the hop of one of the videos would you be more upset if you had pe people didn't show up to your wedding or didn't show up to your funeral? I thought that was a great question. So I want to ask, I'm going to ask you both that same question. I know Tanner, you already have an answer, but uh, we'll get your answer first, but I want to ask Robin as well. So if, would you be more upset if people didn't show up to your wedding or your funeral? My funeral. Yeah, that's kind of a no-brainer, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say wedding, you know. I was gonna say my funeral. Most of my friends would probably have like Alzheimer's, dementia, passed away. <laughs> really? It's like I don't blame them. It's like they probably just forgot. Like, you know? If they didn't show up to my wedding, I figured I'd be marrying the wrong person, right? Like, that's uh, they're not coming. But uh, I'm not married. I don't know. I'm with you. Funeral makes the most sense. That means that you left little to no impact if nobody shows up. <laughs> That, that sucks. That would re that, that's actually heartbreaking now that we're thinking about this. Jesus, emotional questions. I know, right? And that question turned a lot more emotional than I thought it was going to. <laughs> I'm thinking about me myself not having anybody there now, and I'm, I'm ready to go hug my family. <laughs> okay, too good. Robin, random question. Yeah, so um, mine is an ultra random question because you've uh, been getting so much old Dutch ship to you, and you've been having to sell so much. Of it if you had to pair one of your beers with one flavor of old the chips what would it be oh okay this this is classic is what you do is you do the words and clanks so the japanese style lager do that with dill pickle because you get dill oh. and dill on garlic it's, it's oh. complimenting Ooh, that sounds good that sounds really good i'm gonna have to save the can to try that i yeah. like that chips and, <laughs> chips and beer go great together yeah, all the do. time too well see see the thing about the thing about that beer though is the uh the hop we use and it's called sriracha ace people either perceive that as dill or garlic or whatever it's yeah. just it, they just work yeah i guess yeah like i get like garlic chive or something yeah it's pretty yeah, yeah totally I like that all right i got one more are you watching euro 
I I gave up after uh, watching uh, uh, Erickson getting hauled out of the Denmark game there. Yeah. Uh, sorry. My, my, as as I said, my grandfather came from Denmark. Not feeling too great after it. So. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah. I that's why that's why I asked because that was, that was going to be my follow up. But you 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 hit it right on the head. Yeah. I've been watching yeah. Euro two and I saw that. I was like, ooh, that's not yeah. very good for the Dan Denmark fans at all. So. Then again, we never get past round one anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> right? Hey, it's like being a Leafs fan. <laughs> it's just I'm like really being a Leafs fan. I'm, I'm really hoping my cousins in Denmark don't see that, but <laughs> right? no, I, I, I'll, I'm pretty sure on our global map of listeners, Denmark hasn't been hit yet. But maybe now that you're here, we will. We'll have to uh, let your cousins know you were on. I, I was watching this today, and I saw that amazing goal from Czech. Uh, I can't think of his name there, but he hit it from beyond half. It was oh. quite a strike. The goal of the Euro, they called it. So, <laughs> um, But I always keep it on because my office is right here and there's a TV here, so yeah. I'm working. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, any, uh, be, Tanner, before we let you go, we'll, we'll keep you on as we close off, but um, is there anything else you'd like to touch on about Salter Street that we didn't capture? You're sure there's no ghost stories that you don't want to tell us about? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no ghost stories that I'm aware of. Trust me, I would have led with that. <laughs> you would have you had a beer about the ghost story, right? Like, totally because the history is amazing right <laughs> uh no i think i think everything's pretty straightforward you know hopefully people keep uh keep buying our beer and enjoying what they're doing enjoying what we're doing and like i said they keep drinking it we'll keep brewing it nice. i love it and why don't you tell us so we can find you at salterstreetbrewery.ca and yep. um what's the address if we can come down and visit your patio uh we are unit 131 salter street toronto and that is East End, folks. It doesn't matter where you're from. That is the East End. <laughs> I think I'm right, right? Was I right? <laughs> you were right. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> awesome. Listen, Tanner, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, hang with us while we close hey, up. And, uh, and, thank, and thank you so much for having us on. You know oh, I mean? it was a pleasure, man. We're so yeah, happy to have was. you. It's, uh, it, and it was awesome to be able to just chat and learn about your, you know, what Salter Street Brewery is all about and the amazing beers your, do your team is doing. And and, you know, like I said, uh, we love to see these classic styles. So keep doing what you guys are doing and, you know, we'll make sure we keep support it. Thank you. Love it. And um, Robin, who do we got next week? Uh, next week, we've got left field on. Um, but after that, who is it that we're, we've got on, Ryan? I mean, I know left field next week. I don't have the answer to that one on hand, oh, Robin. Okay. So we love won't share marks, that though. today. <laughs> that will be a bit of a mystery. But next week, we've got left field. Can't wait to chat with those folks. We will. That's fantastic. And thanks again, Tanner. Everyone, check out Salter Street Brewery and get some of these classic beers that they're brewing. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. And we'll see, we'll see. Yes. We'll see. Shalante, as they say as well. We'll see you next week. <laughs>